everyone. I hope you're enjoying your time at the conference. My name is Kristen Chernishoff and I am the Programs Director at WikiTongues, a nonprofit which provides the tools and resources needed to sustain linguistic diversity around the world. And so I was invited to speak today about digital language activism. Acknowledging that minoritized and indigenous languages have been displaced by what we've created as dominant languages through colonization and forced assimilation is critical to understanding the purpose of language reclamation within our digital age. So building upon this language reclamation can become a form of resistance to the hegemonic forces of dominant languages and cultures. And the term language reclamation can be used really to detail a social process of claiming or either reclaiming the appropriate cultural context and value that the language would have sustained if not for colonization, political and social suppression, and other violent forms of erasure. And so at Wikitongues, we believe that it is important to frame the concept of language reclamation as this social process, since it acknowledges that all languages are vital to, the, to our world. And so through this discourse, we also emphasize the ways in which people are using their languages in daily spheres to reinforce this cultural identity. And chief among these daily spheres is, of, of course, the internet, which we're using to connect right now. And the internet can perhaps be the most disruptive of, of all forms of media. But media forms in general have always been vital for the spread of language awareness and revitalization. So for example, in the 19th century, less than a decade before the passage of the Indian Removal Act in the United States, the Cherokee syllabary was developed in a large part for producing a Cherokee language newspaper, which was primarily intended to keep the geographically dispersed members of the Cherokee nation more easily in contact with each other and aware of one another and what they were doing. So namely, Cherokee intellectuals believed that mediatizing, if, if we could use that term, mediatizing their language was necessary to resist the assimilating violence of the United States government. And written media may have facilitated the first uh, quote unquote dominant cultures in the sense that for the first time in history, there was this popular capacity for conceiving particular languages as politically prestigious. So for another example, without the abundance of written Latin, the political military dominance of Rome may not have been enough to establish Roman culture as aspirational for individuals within the Roman Empire whose mother tongues were um, as varied as Etruscan or, or Basque. And so it's only logical then that as access to media production expanded over the 15th and 16th centuries, more languages were sent to this, this new realm of language prestige and cultural prestige. But nevertheless, just as media in a politically dominant language can marginalize some cultures, the creation of media in the languages that are often pushed to the sides or, uh, by governments and social pressures, the, the creation of this media can also serve as a vehicle for language revitalization and growth. And so really now, for the first time in history, the barriers to entry for media creation are quite low, making the distribution of and access to native language media, uh, native meaning like mother tongue language media, both written and oral, more possible than ever. And although currently the internet is unfortunately quite English centric, it is changing on a, on a daily basis, but it does still have the potential to provide this level playing field where all languages can access the same suite of support, undermining the perceived superiority of these quote unquote prestige languages. And we see this happening on a daily basis through meme campaigns. You might remember during the International Year of Indigenous Languages in 2019, there were some wonderful meme campaigns and mother tongue campaigns going on on Twitter. Um, lots of things happening on Twitter, different Facebook groups, things like that. Another example is recognition by the International Standards Organization, an ISO code, which provides a community with a three character identifier for their language, which is the ISO code. I. I just mentioned. And so getting this ISO code, it practically extends vital browser and software support by enabling functions like search, display, translation, and localization in, in different language texts. And so conceptually, this also implies digital equity. And so securing ISO recognition can often be a catalyst for energizing a community towards language reclamation. 
for example, uh, since the Jeju people of Korea recently released recently received an ISO code for their language, thanks in large part to lobbying efforts from a, a young member within the community, enthusiasm for learning the language has surged, including efforts to teach it and disseminate documentation. And so once the language was made digitally accessible, it transcended the status of this quote unquote dialect to a place of cultural pride. And this story also highlights the importance to me of a community within the language reclamation process. Without institutional support, languages are unfortunately gradually restricted, oftentimes to the private sphere. And this can make a struggle for speakers to find one another with the language fading slowly from time. And so whether the goal is to reverse the language at the trend of language attrition for a language or to revive a dormant language, Reclamation requires building the infrastructure of community. And so to put this all succinctly, uh, speakers have to find one another. And the internet, thankfully, makes that easier to do across geographical um, and cultural boundaries. Another great example is a community that we work with in Louisiana, the Tunica Biloxi tribe. And when Chief uh, Yushigan of the Tunica Biloxi tribe died in 1948, he took with him the spoken form of his people's ancestral language. Thankfully, he had collaborated with a linguist in the United States to leave behind a written record of the Tunica language in the form of different extensive vocabularies and a standardized grammar. And tribal elders who were contemporaries of the chief were able to retain knowledge of their ancestral language through traditional songs and stories. And so thanks to the language's preservation, Revitalization efforts began not long after his death, but because of the lack of social context and institutional support, the initiatives unfortunately fell flat. But since 2010, there's been an increasing momentum towards reclamation, and that's thanks in large part to initiatives spearheaded by the Pierrette family, um, who are tribal members with ancestral ties to Tunica leadership. So. In the 1980s, uh, Donna, Donna Perry, took it upon herself to cultivate community enthusiasm for revitalizing the Tunica language. And this was in large part inspired by her husband's personal language reclamation journey. But at the time, most documentation of Tunica was stored away in university archives and they weren't easily accessible. And so Donna actually would drive often to Baton Rouge and New Orleans to access these make photocopies and bring them home. And so the wider process of bringing her language home actually lasted for the better part of a decade. And by the mid 1990s, it had become this family activity with her husband, Michael, and their children, Jean-Luc and Elizabeth. And so together, the Pierre family, they set out to build a community around reclaiming their ancestral language through the distribution of media. Jean-Luc would publish websites about the language um, using the now defunct hosting service GeoCities. Great service. <laughs> Just have to uh, think, brings me back to a lot in my childhood. <laughs> I had a little nostalgia moment when I mentioned that. Um, Donna launched uh, Tawaka, a series of print and newsletters in and about the Tunica language with support from tribal leadership. And through this outreach, they were able to engage a handful of other Tunica families, some who were living off reservation maybe as far as way as Nevada and um, other states. And so often readers would reply inspired asking for materials so that they could begin learning the language. And so thanks to their deployment of media, Donna and her family were able to successfully organize a community of learners around their language who would build the foundation of reclamation. And this has shifted to a digital um, organization of, uh, of a community. And so according to Donna's daughter, Elizabeth, the real turning point for the reclamation of Tunica was probably about 2010 when a member of their learner community, which was growing at the time, approached Tulane University in New Orleans with a proposal to secure academic support for their efforts. And so this made it not only possible to build on the previous work, uh, the, the vocabularies and the grammar that I mentioned before, but it also helps legitimize the work in the eyes of the broader community. By 2014, they secured funding to organize language immersion classes, which last year uh, moved online, of course, like, like everything did. Um, and this marked the beginning of structured institutional support for their revitalization program. Elizabeth regularly teaches online classes through Facebook, 
and other platforms for beading um, and similar arts and sciences from the, the Tunic of Alexi tribe. And they have this fabulous meme campaign that they deploy through Twitter and Facebook groups that's absolutely hilarious and, and wonderfully well done to keep people excited um, and to keep it focused in the digital age. And so nowadays there's upwards of 100 active learners who have enrolled in the na uh, language immersion program, which is nearly 10% of the overall tribal population. And what's really exciting is that there are currently 32 new fluent native speakers, among them parents who are passing their language down to their children. And so in the same way that these male newsletters helped forge the early community in the 1990s, the advent of social media has enabled the leaders of the Tunica reclamation movement to generate interest on a broader scale today and on a broader geographical reach. And so the internet makes it possible for speakers and learners to build bridges across these chasms of cultural displacement, which really bolsters the language reclamation movements. And so previously, getting away from the, these examples, but just around the discourse, um, previously discourse surrounding languages and language revitalization has often focused on the loss of language from our world. Um, you always hear stats about how many languages are going to disappear within certain decades and years and things like that. And I, I always find that this damage-centered research reinforces the idea that minoritized and indigenous languages are changed, chain, stumbling over my words here, sorry. I find that this, this research always reinforces the idea that languages are chained to the past, that they're, they're there to be put into museums. And that's not what we're here for. There is instead a growing number of language communities resisting these homogenizing efforts um, by returning to and actively using their heritage and cultural languages. And many of these language users have championed the support provided by digital spaces where access to the means of media production has made it possible for people to create their own content. And as I mentioned earlier at the beginning, there's tons of campaigns that are regularly being launched to promote language use online and new resources are regularly published to support growing movements. Um, and on that note, I would love to highlight in this by highlighting uh, a two important resources and opportunities. So the first one is from our friends at Rising Voices. They are currently creating a new toolkit, which will be specifically focused on this issue, how to be a digital language activist. I think it'll be ready to publicly launch at the beginning of the year, coinciding nicely with the International Decade of Indigenous Languages, which starts in January. And so you can follow them for more updates of how to use this um, freely accessible resource and get started within your community. And on our end at Wikitongues, if you're a language activist or a burgeoning language activist and you want to launch a revitalization movement within your community, we now actually provide yearly grants to an activist cohort, which is very exciting. And we are opening this, opening this application process um, to the public for the first time at the end of this year. So applications, I do not have the exact date yet when we will open that, but it'll be at the end of this year. So you can follow us on social media or reach out to us to stay updated on that. And as part of the grant, you not only receive um, a stipend, but you also have access to a large network of um, our contacts in our community. You'll be in a group of the other language activists within the cohort for regular meetings and project support. And then you'll also receive um, volunteer support from Arvin to help you with your project. And so if you have any specific questions about that, you can send me an email at kristen at wikitongues.org and we'd love to get your application. Thank you all for listening to my talk. I'm sorry if I I rambled and went a bit fast. I was trying to fit it all into the into the short time frame that we have here. So thank you all for listening and I hope you enjoy the rest of your conference and have a great day.